Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it gives me great pleasure to moderate uh, this panel uh, with esteemed guests uh, representing very exciting um, sectors uh, from academics to uh, global organization to a local organization, but actually operates globally. Um, the topic of today is about partnerships, and this is something that I have been hearing all morning um, through the main addresses on partnerships, um, solidarity, and it's a very important topic to us, especially in the UAE, because this is how our country was actually founded. It's about partnerships and unity that brought us together. So with that in mind, um, I'd like to start this session with a um, 30 second kind of elevator pitch where we talk about the SDG 17, Partnerships for the Goals, which addresses the need for cross-border and cross-sector partnerships. And how does a lucrative and innovative partnership with global impact look like, in your opinion? If we could start with you, Your Excellency Henrietta. Well, thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. Um, <laughs> It, the word lucrative is very interesting. It means that you want both parts of the partnership to have some return. Uh, I have seen a couple of them. One that I have seen was the Swatch Bharat, the Clean India program. It affected an entire country. It allowed for hygienic water and sanitation programs to begin, but it also allowed many young people and women to start small businesses. So they became the ones who put in um, toilets in a school, that put in um, a village, a um, hand washing area. So it becomes something that's good for the country, excellent policy, it's good for business, broad-based growth. Um, so it's an example of how a good partnership can work to change a country. Great, we'll come back to that in, in a bit. Um, Dr. Walid. What about from a borderless education perspective? Well, I think, uh, Your Excellency, I think the, the, still the partnerships in, in terms of, if I've tried to summarize it, okay, what, what do you mean by partnership across? And I came to put it into four points. First, we need uh, to have collaborative cross-sectoral uh, uh, engagement, so we make the benefits uh, of the best partners. We, uh, we need to have active communication because we need to, uh, across the different types of stakeholders, uh, we need to, uh, from companies to kids, we need to speak their language so we get them on board. And uh, the third point would be we need to have goal-oriented and impact-focused uh, mm -hmm. partnerships. In this way, we will have these goals with clear vision, specific outcomes, measurable, also, transparency and accountability is a key element of it. Last point will be, we need to be innovative, adaptive and agile. We need to have brave and uh, new ways of thinking. At the same time, we need to have flexibility to be responsive to the unforeseen circumstances. So this is how I sh I'm looking at partnerships and how it works. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Arturo. From your perspective, from an academic and competitiveness per perspective, what does that mean in terms of innovative and lucrative partnerships? First of all, it's interesting that I'm going to, to repeat what we have heard from our distinguished panelists, but probably in, a, in another context. So I, I always speak about competitiveness. And there is a competitiveness is a, is a misnomer because it appeals to competition. And in fact, it's not the case. So. Competitiveness is about collaboration, so it's about partnerships. But I like this aspect of the win-win partnership. That is, as an economist, we realize that partnerships only happen when you have the two parties benefiting. And I think that for that to happen, we need innovation. That is, we need to find new business models, new financial structures, new ways of collaborate that actually then create benefits for both, both sides. Now, I think the danger would be to understand that this lucrative aspect of a partnership means monetary returns. And that's why I think the social return is much more important. But finally, and to conclude my pitch, you know, partnerships is about building competitive nations at the end of the day. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Arturo. Um, Your Excellency, 
in today's connected world, um, international development is synonymous, as we heard, with basically 2030 agenda. And in your opinion, what are the challenges that we need to address um, in order to ensure global partnerships leaves no one behind? Well, it's a big challenge, and I think it's one that um, we all need to take up and that we need to sort of recommit to. So one point is that none of the SDGs will be met if we don't use public-private partnerships. You can't do it alone. You just simply can't. Um, the Secretary General Martin mentioned parliamentarians and the whole tech sector, a very important partnership. So that's most important. The second piece that I think is a, a, something that's different now, Hala, is that uh, in the 1990s, we went through a time of privatizations because many of the governments ran out of money. And we are at a time when there are a lot of governments that are economically in difficult times to meet their debt obligations. And as a result, re-looking at some of the lessons of privatizations and parastatals and how public and private sectors work together for the benefit of hospitals, of schools, of um, transportation, would make sense at this Absolutely. time. And I think there are two accelerators that are challenges that we could be thinking about. One is education, because it is the foundation of a world at peace. And the second is water, because it is um, the place where public health and growing nutritious food and um, being good stewards of the environment meet. And we have all the tools now to do that, and that would be a good place to start in the challenges. Great. So on education, Dr. Walid, um, how do you achieve borderless education? Um, what is actually that you look in, in, in a partnership? What are the characteristics that you look in a partnership to ensure that there is proper in a, in a connected world, there is a proper borderless edu education. Well, uh, partnership is, is a key element uh, that we drive. I mean, day one, when His Highness announced the digital in initiative at the peak of COVID, November 2020, on the same day, His Highness announced an alliance for the future of digital education. Why? Because it's a new concept, because Many people ask, what is digital education? What is digital educator? And we want to bring everybody together and start thinking about this uh, uh, new way of education or new ways and the potentials that it can bring. And that's why uh, 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 we always focus on partnerships. So far, we have uh, 35 or more partners on board with us, from technology to academy to governments uh, to nonprofits to work with us. But if in education, how we select a partner, we focus on a partner who really have passion toward education in their mandate and in their focus. Also, we look for partners who understand the context that they are operating in, the socio-economical aspects of, of the students. And more importantly, we focus on partners who put students first. Uh, last point, we focus on a partner who who give high priority to measuring, to measurement of impact. So this is kind of the main things that we look into when we select or engage with a partner. Maybe Dr. Walid, we can go a step back and if you can tell us a little bit on why the dig digital school was introduced um, in Dubai. I think it's important for the audience to understand that and then what partners you had to forge in order to go forward with it. Well, uh, digital school was established at a very difficult time uh, uh, when governments were questioning, shall we move to online learning? What is online learning? Let's delay the academic year. And uh, uh, His Highness was saying, well, if the whole world in matter of days with the biggest disruption for education in, in modern age managed to continue some parts of education uh, in, in, in digital way. And by digital, I mean, you know, uh, internet, TV, radio, SMS, uh, WhatsApp, there are many models. If they manage to continue their education in a matter of weeks, then why we can't use some of that technology and benefit those who don't have access to education? And as we go, we will develop and evolve this new mode of uh, educational opportunities that we can offer. So this is how digital school started. 
Thank you, Dr. Walid. Professor Arturo, from your book, The Right Place, um, what potential initiatives can you suggest for governments mm -hmm. to implement in order to nurture innovation and create meaningful partnerships to make their countries more pros prosperous um, and therefore achieve the sustainable development goals over time? Mm -hmm. Actually, the recipe seems quite simple. I mean, we need to understand the problem. So if, if I ask around, think about the very simple question. So why do you see that the, the big digital platforms of today are coming from just two regions in the world? So you have uh, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, and then Alibaba, Tencent, Samsung. It, they are all both concentrated in you know, China and South Korea and the United States. Why don't we have a dominant digital platform mm. in the Middle East? Hmm. Or, or in Europe? And the answer, so there is the wrong answer, which I always get from my executive. Oh, you know, people in the Middle East or in Europe, they don't have an innovative mind. Or this, this uh, risk of failure is not present in our culture. That's not true. I mean, the, the main, the main uh, explanation for, or reason for that, if you look at the innovation that happens in Eastern Europe, you know, it's amazing. It's probably at the level of Silicon Valley. What happens is that all of this innovation talent leaves those countries. Okay. So the answer for why, for example, there is not a digital platform in, in the Middle East is twofold. Reason number one, fragmentation of regulation. Mm. So if you have a digital platform that wants to operate in the Middle East or in Europe, you need to abide by 50 different regulations. Mm. And the second and most important one is money. I mean, here I'm wearing my finance professor hat. I mean, we talked earlier about returns, yes. so it seems contradictory. But at the end of the day, in order to have innovation, you need money. It's an investment. The reason why you have uh, companies like Google or the likes in Silicon Valley is because it's the center of, of the world's venture capital so, market. So, 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 we need, we need, so just, we need to invest more in innovation. It's not a question of mindset, of collaboration. It's, it's just putting the check by the, by the government first to finance innovation. So, so in your opinion, what is the challenge to funding innovation? Hmm. Especially in, in, let's say, your European um, countries hmm. or in the Middle Eastern hmm. countries. In your opinion, what is the real challenge that is preventing the yes. funding of innovation? I, I will mention two. two. One, one, one challenge is the lack of capital markets. And I think in that aspect, the UAE, but all countries like a, like Saudi Arabia as well, or Oman, they're actually improving the quality of their capital markets. And the second one, I go back to the partnership discussion, is that financing the new initiatives that have to do with technology and sustainability require partnerships between public sector capital or donors and then private sector financial capital. So public sector money that takes the, the social costs and the social risks of the investment, and then private sector money that sizes the financial return. And these blended finance packages are going to be fundamental also as a way to build partnerships between the public and the private sector. Thank you, Professor. Um, Your Excellency, I would like to move to the topic of impact. Um, and I would like to ask you um, on, on impact is that with more than four decades, um, of experience in multiple sectors across different domains um, and reflecting on key programs that you have participated in and you will always remember, what were the most crucial elements uh, to the partnerships and how did it evolve in driving impact? Um, so uh, it is um, four decades is a long time, but it gives you a sense of history and why certain things work, and certainly scale is part of it. Um, to Professor Brees's point, uh, the amount of money that is put in so that it is not uh, something that is just barely funded, that it's an idea that is significantly funded, and its ambition mm -hmm. is to change a country. So I would say that PEPFAR and the whole approach on HIV AIDS, which Grash and Michelle and um, many of the Africans um, have seen firsthand. That changed um, 
That changed the lives of many, many people. It also meant that we learned at the same time, so we learned about the transmission of HIV AIDS from a mother to a child and how to stop that. Um, and in that whole health sector, polio, very important, smallpox, um, COVID. So we learned a lot. It was scale that made a difference. Mm -hmm. um, the second program that I would mention is one that UNICEF has been talking about, um, GIGA and Generation Unlimited on education. Mm -hmm. Because if you, can, if you can educate this young cohort, the largest in the world, I mean, you will be able to change the world. Mm -hmm. um, and then I might just mention a third one that I saw, which was that research, it was the fundamental basis of the Green Revolution, but the research institutes where you can have drought tolerant wheat, where you can have rice that is uh, grown in salt water, it changes what farmers are able to do, it changes the availability of food and nutrition in the world. But all of these are at scale, and that makes a very big difference. I think one of our hardest challenges now as a world is to do the ones that are very human. Um, in Kazakhstan, there is a program about helping young people to not commit suicide. Mm. It's very, very difficult to approach those programs because it's not techno technology. Mm. It is the human heart and mind, yep. but it is done through peer group so that a schoolmate would tell another schoolmate that they think they're a little down and they'd get help right away. It reduced the suicide weights in the country. So some of those ideas we just need to spread mm -hmm. so that we can scale them as a world. Thank you, Dr. Henrietta. Um, Dr. Walid, uh, staying on impact and talking about um, things that you need to do from the heart and in a digital divided world, mm -hmm. um, how do you narrow the gaps in quality education? Well, I Through think partnerships, it, it, I guess. It, it, it is, it is a very important question, I think, and we get it uh, always, like, how do you bridge the digital gap through digital, in, in digital school? And uh, we always say we don't, uh, we, we are not an initiative that we distribute tablets, because people think digital education, yes. you give tablets, you give connectivity. We look at it more holistically, uh, a holistic system that covers uh, uh, digital inclusion policies should cover of course, the enabler, which is technology and infrastructure and connectivity, but beyond that, you have uh, lit ICT literacy for teachers and the community. You have content, digital educational content. You need to have how you drive the whole change process across different communities and map to their needs. This holistic approach is what we are trying in addition to accrediting those students who are going through this journey. So. We, we provide some parts of these elements in terms of the teacher's training program. We built a full program with Arizona State University. Uh, we are providing the platform uh, through partnerships on the platform. We do some other things we facilitate through partnerships. So, for example, connectivity. In Egypt and Mauritania, we did a very nice partnership with the telecom operators there, and they provided access to the platform. Uh, also, on partnerships, uh, one of our biggest implementation in Egypt is, in Egypt is with the Wood Food Program, who are, uh, everybody say, Wood Food Program doesn't do education. Say, no, no, they genuinely believe that mm -hmm. education is a key enabler to eradicate hunger. Uh, access to technology, we, we announced a couple of partnerships uh, with the UAE Red Crescent. We will build or they will help us build 1,000 digital learning space across locations. It's only changing perspectives. They are used to build the schools. Now we're telling them there is another way that can help more people to benefit. And this is how we leverage on partnerships to cover the holistic approach that we are trying to build. Thank you, Dr. Walid. Professor, um, so from the heart to uh, partnerships, technology partnerships, to governments, um, and from your reports and trends and on competitiveness, in your opinion, what kind of innovative partnerships do governments need to adopt in order to move those drivers and create that impact? Mm. Uh, the, the, uh, what I was referring to earlier, all these new financial packages yes. where private and public capital come together, 
they are going to be they are going to be paramount. Mm -hmm. um, we should not forget also that at the end of the day, when we we implement the the, the SDGs, it is all about transferring financing from the rich to the poor countries, mm -hmm. and I think this requires partnerships at these two levels between the public and the private sector, but also between and across governments. And, and this requires some kind of new type of global financial market that uh, allows these flows of capital in a much easier way. To move around. Mm. Thank you, uh, Professor. Um, Henrietta, you spoke about collaborative efforts and collaborations when it comes to partnerships. Um, and I wanted to hear from you on how partnerships between governments, the private sector, the international organizations, how can it be leveraged to create shared value um, and promote sustainable development, especially in developing countries? We heard from Professor Artur, it's about the rich supporting the poor. From your perspective, how does that work when it comes to collaborations? So um, Arturo's point uh, that it has to be a good mechanism, I think is part of it. It has to be respectful, it has to be um, long-term, and it has to have the characteristics that both sides feel that they're being treated fairly. Mm. And if you don't have that, then the partnership will fall apart. And in the end, development is a long-term, complex game. And it is important that you create that trust. But there are times when um, one can address something that's very short term. So for instance, right now, after the earthquake in Turkey and Syria, um, I know that uh, Dubai Cares and UAE has really stepped forward with filling uh, blankets and food and um, clothing to be sent. That is something that you can do together because a private entity might have an airplane and you would have individuals, just all of us, would give something out of our homes to help a family in need. Mm -hmm. And those kinds of partnerships, the ones that involve citizenry, mm -hmm. are very important. They're not monetary. So um, to the professor's point, we need the very complex financial frameworks mm -hmm. and we need the uh, community involvement of the people types of partnerships, if we're really going to change our world, um, both are needed. It makes a lot of sense. So on, on that, on, and on putting the help together for uh, the victims or, or the people of Syria and Turkey, and what we have seen um, as a nation for UAE, putting all its efforts together, creating community engagements through volunteerism, etc. Um, Dr. Walid, if, if we look at that and then you look at the youth, uh, which is an important segment that you are addressing, what are the key characteristics and values do you want or the vocabulary that you want or skills that you want the youth to be speaking when we talk, we talk about sustainable development and partnerships. What, what would you instill in them to make sure that they run for volunteering, run for partnering as a community and, and, and be involved and engaged in supporting cross-border um, and cross-sector um, dilemmas that we face? Well, I think youth are the future and, and if you don't uh, enable the youth, the youth and uh, educate them and make them aware of the different responsibilities and the different challenges that the world is facing, then we will be in a very difficult situation. Uh, that's why uh, at the Mohammed Barashat Global Initiatives, focus on community engagement and youth is very, very important element. Uh, maybe if I give you an example. Uh, we do several campaigns, uh, uh, and one of the campaigns was a winter campaign last year. And the idea was how we can engage this new generation, the young kids. And we engaged with a, a computer gaming uh, famous celebrity kid, and we told them how about we work together to do a campaign for winter uh, for kids. And he said, Yes, I mean, he's a blogger, gamer, famous across the kids. First time I hear about him at the time. 
and the challenge was uh, 10 million dollars and he said okay I'll do it my way so he locked himself in a glass room in front of Burj Khalifa live feeding and he started to talk to his fans and followers and let's raise and he started to encourage them uh, he expected to get it in, in a week I think but he spent 10 days but he managed to achieve it what is surprising in all across all the donations that we're seeing you'll see small amounts of donations compared compared to the big amounts and these are the kids who you managed to reach them i had a friend who was telling me what have you done who's this guy my kids are begging me to donate uh, so this is an example how you can reach them but also there is at policy level at schools level at awareness level that embed partnerships and different uh, aspects of being human-centric citizens, uh, global citizens of the world. So basically you put the problem and the solution back into their hands to be able to take it forward in their own language, and this is probably the reason Definitely for success. you need to engage with them, but also at policy level and educators yes. need to have structured programs to, to achieve this level of understanding or transferring. Otherwise, it can't be ad hoc. Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Walid. Okay. Professor Arturo, um, before I move to the closing section, I, I have uh, um, to ask you, um, would you consider the official development assistance, the ODA published by the OECD, to be an indicative of countries in the, in the adoption of Goal 17? So, I mean, if you look back in history, I think that the experience that we have about the economic aid is not very, it's not very successful in the sense that mm -hmm. I think donor countries have always exploited in one way or another uh, the economic aid that they were giving. I mean, I was right before coming here, I was in, in Mexico and I was talking to Mexican executives who were complaining a lot about how damaging it was for Mexico the aid that they were receiving from the, from the United States. So I think that the mechanism that we have had for economic aid with offsets and so on has been damaging at the end because it has actually increased massively inequalities. And, mm. and, uh, and there's also very strong academic evidence of that. So I think that these new initiatives by the OECD, I think they, they are solving that problem in a very good way uh, because they go back to building partnership. That is to investing in countries in need actually with a, with a set of incentives that benefit both, what we were discussing earlier. So I'm very hopeful, and in principle on paper, sounds uh, extremely, extremely well. My only concern is again that we need to find these good business models that result in financial packages that are, that are uh, attractive for, for both sides. Okay. And you believe we will find that good business I think model that see, you eventually? See, in Africa in particular, you see very good examples mm -hmm. of infrastructure funding where you see these two ingredients coming together and where the ODA program is, is actually contributing. And it, it, it creates this win-win business model that I'm are referring to. Only in this way. I think that if we go back to the old stories about values and you know helping countries develop and then my mission in life and so on, I think at the end of the day, I'm Too speaking like a hardcore economist, I think we need incentives. So the, the world will, will work if we have the right set of incentives. And I think the OECD is in the right way in this, in this case. Absolutely. And I think this is what you also refer to, Your Excellency, in terms of what are the incentives that we give both public and the private sector to make this partnership work. And maybe that's something you can shed a light on um, before I move to the very last closing question. Um, well, I think the incentives are absolutely key, and um, Professor Briss is, is right. It is, it is that it, it has to be something that's of value to each, but does not distort. One area that I think has not been used enough are guarantees by governments, because they can absorb much of the risk. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Your Excellency. So last question for, for the three of you, starting with, with uh, Your Excellency. So the world requires trillions of dollars to successfully implement the SDGs by 2030. What lucrative partnerships, and again, I stress on the word lucrative, <laughs> um, in your opinion, must be in place today to ensure a better tomorrow, a prosperous 2030, and inclusive 
non-divided 2045. One minute, um, if we can just hear from all three of you, starting with you. All right, so I would try um, to focus on a few things that we could accomplish now with our current technologies. And for that, I would focus on education and I would focus on water. And I believe that they could be lucrative, they could be effective for communities, they could be effective for business, for governments and academia. Um, but in the end, all of us want a better world. And perhaps um, the World Government Summit could pair with the World Economic Forum and perhaps come up with some of these frameworks for the future Absolutely. so that we can all work on it together. We will make sure that that is taken forward <laughs> to the organizers. Dr. Walid. Well, I'll, I'll go back to the, to the four uh, aspects that I mentioned. We should make sure any partnership that uh, we have it should be collaborative. Uh, we should make sure we should have active communication with the different types of stakeholders. Uh, we should focus on impact uh, and also we should have innovative and brave uh, uh, ideas to drive. Actually, uh, in the closing, I'm going from this session to another partnership uh, session where we will announce four strategic partnerships for Digital School. Some of them related to funding, some of them related to high tech and chat GPT in education, and we hope we can make more impact with this. All the best, Dr. Walid. Yeah. Professor? Yeah, I think, I think you, if you look at the lessons that we have learned within countries of good governance, the UAE is a good example of how, for example, the public sector and the private sector get together and listen to each other. I think we need to find the same level of coordination across countries. So, for example, in essence, the United Nations is not the right response to build these partnerships because it involves only the public sector somehow. Mm -hmm. um, but by the same token, the World Economic Forum uh, or the OECD are not the right, the right venues for partnerships either. So I think we need to build kind of a delivery unit at the world level that involve international organizations, uh, governments, representation of the private sector, large multinationals is kind of, I don't know how to, how to call it, it's like, a, you know, uh, it's like the UEFA of, uh, you know, of, of, of the world economy and, and, or the FIFA of the world economy, <laughs> not to be exclusive. And, and, and then only through this collaboration and this coordination we can have this good solution because all the, all the, the ways that we have now to coordinate efforts are only partial. It's only public sector or private sector or developed economies. Or, so, so we always leave someone out and we need a, a full representation Great. of the entire Thank world you. economy. Thank you, yeah. Professor. I think the key word here is delivery, the delivery vehicle. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of organizations and committees and, and uh, um, um, organizations basically planning, but we really need to find that right delivery mechanism to take this forward. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank all esteemed guests. It was a very insightful conversation. I learned a lot today. Thank you for your time. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being great listeners today. Thank you.